all in the brain, but I'm not saying that it is either. And, uh, you know, if yeah, there I, I are, uh, if there are other beings, then it's not like they're part of a separate spiritual supernatural realm because all of reality is a unity. It, it, everything is, you know, it's, there's nothing outside the realm of science. Uh, but, but right now, I feel like consciousness is, is a different tool of, or mode of experiencing a uh, reality. And the thing is, is that these aren't just drug induced states. People call the psychedelic experience, a human experience a lot because the same mode of experiencing reality can also be triggered through meditation, through deep states of meditation, uh, through yogic practices, or through various mm -hmm. means, it seems that diving into these realms or non-ordinary states of consciousness is what they're called, isn't mm -hmm. just something unique to psychedelics. It's actually part of the human brain and body. So it's very fascinating. Absolutely. And I encourage yeah, people I, I... to... Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, please finish. We have I... a little bit of a lag. I apologize. Okay. I encourage people to actually to check out... Eastern philosophies, like like Buddhist thought on this topic, um, I think, and this is also something I see for the future of people who are leaving religion, is exploring consciousness and raising awareness. And I think this is how we can heal as people, raising our consciousness and awareness, uh, kind of stepping outside of ourselves to see how we need to heal becoming more conscious and mindful of our thoughts and our actions, and then raising that awareness on a societal level too. And I think that there are certain disciplines like psychedelics and meditation that tend to cultivate self-awareness that leads to healing and love and transformation. And uh, Eastern philosophy, like Buddhist psychology, is actually incredibly sophisticated. I was shocked when I started learning about it. It, it taught me how to relate to my emotions entirely differently, to have this perspective of non-duality. Part of the problem with religion is that it, it judges everything as good or bad, good and evil, chosen and damned. And really, on an ultimate level, good and evil, there's an element to perspective about it. And when we judge our thoughts and emotions, or when we judge people as bad, that doesn't stop bad behavior. So sin is the problem. Duality is the problem. Um, you know, when people do bad things, we don't fix them by calling them evil. We fix them by saying that, like, there's a reason that you've done these things and it's not part of your nature. It just is. And we examine that and we heal through doing that. So anyway, like Buddhism and Eastern philosophy even Hinduism, there's a lot of profound knowledge that's often very rational in there. Um, and I missed out on a lot of it because I was triggered by it because I, because of my association with religion and because I was so like, well, I'm an atheist. There can't be anything to this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's a mistake for atheists to actually relate that to the supernatural. Now, I've had experiences similar to that. I've had conversations with people that were not there, clearly, um, and when you're in a lucid state. It's very, very strange. And when when people are on these trips and they're having these experiences, I think it's I think it's an appropriate just to try to to by fiat say some kind of neuro the, uh, theological reductivist approach. Um, granted, it could be that it could be because the way we're hardwired, the brain, the, the, the way the brain is. However, it doesn't explain certain things to me. We have actually had numerous discoveries from people that have discovered shit on these types of psychedelics. Uh, people, uh, Francis Crick, Crick discovered the double helix by use of psychedelics. Mm -hmm. uh, the person who discovered PCR, polymerase change reactions, that was due to psychedelics. There are some things that people have gained knowledge of some kind by taking these things, whether, whether that was given to them by entities. You know, I, I can't make that kind of leap. Don't get me wrong. I am more of an internalist. Right. However, it is such a, an interesting and fascinating thing to, to, to experience. And, and I will tell people this. If any one of you have never had these experiences and you don't want to try these psychedelics, by the way, I do want to try DMD. I honestly really do. You could do a self-induction yourself. I have done self-induction numerous times. You can induce yourself to an altered state of, of consciousness. They used to call this transcendental meditation of things that are similar. And you can actually feel yourself 
going into this tunnel. You can feel yourself going into this landscape that pops up to you. You can feel yourself walking along the beach. You can feel yourself flying through the air. It is, it is indescribable, but it's, it is a actual sensory experience. You have tactile sensation. You have emotional attachments. These are very real experiences. Now, whether, again, they're dualistic, whether they're ontologically um, something that exists literally, uh, or even from a kind of a perennial type thing or uh, experiential, I, I, I don't know. But these experiences are factual. Uh, scientists have known this for a long time. They, they've, as a matter of fact, right now, they're doing studies on DMT, and they want people that have shared these experiences to find out why the commonality of these shared experiences happen. So you can actually do these things in self. Have you ever done a self induction as far as like a, a meditation thing and got into that, that mental state and have that breakthrough where you're, you know, in a, in a lucidity type environment and it's not through by, by just a random thing falling asleep. Yeah, not quite, but I've, I've had some of these experiences just kind of happen to me too, without explanation, which I don't understand, but there's also something called holotropic breath work. Uh, there are workshops put on this guy named Stanislav Grobe, who is a big psychedelic researcher. Uh, and he puts on these workshops and different people put it on holotropic breath work. It's called where you can induce uh, psychedelic states of consciousness or non-ordinary states of consciousness. They're known as just through breathing, the breathing technique. So similar to what you're saying. Yep. I haven't done it yet. Oh, breathing plays, breathing plays a huge portion. When you do a, when you're self-inducing into the state, you have to really take large deep breaths. Um, you have to relax yourself. You have to allow yourself to fall into the state. Um, and like I said, I know a lot of atheists are very, very much against these types of things thinking there's nothing, they, they, they never happen because they've never, some people have never experienced these things. I get that. But I'm just scared. I, I think, yeah, I think six to nine percent people have sleep paralysis, and those people tend to have lucid dreams, so they know what we're talking about. But if you've never experienced this for, before, I get how people can just by fiat say it's all bullshit and new age woo woo. It's not. It's not. This is this is actually where it goes into things like psychology and 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 philosophy of the mind. Philosophy of the mind is a huge thing on this. Whether these things are actual ontological things or not. But I don't know any serious psycho, uh, uh, psychiatrist or uh, philosopher or scientist even that doesn't say these things don't happen. I, I don't know anyone who would make that kind of argument. I would be afraid that I would have right. a horrible trip, though. That would be my thing. I, I would, I, I would be terrified. A guy. That, um, yeah, I would be one of those people that have just – because there's sometimes that when I'm, when I'm smoking marijuana that um, I get well, DMT into only like lasts like super minutes, paranoid. Though, so. You're really not going to have a bad trip with DMT, from what I understand. 15 minutes is a long time, though, I'm sure. It doesn't feel like 15 minutes, though, does it? Well, sure, no, no, time, yeah, time, yeah, and also if you take an MAOI inhibitor, it actually increases it much longer to, to even an hour or, or longer. So the, these inhibitors you can take, because what happens, DMT metabolizes very quickly in the, in, the, in the body. So you want to take some kind of inhibitor that prevents that metabolization to make the trip longer. And you have to have pretty high doses to, to get this, what this called that breakthrough. Um, like I said, I, we're not, I'm not advocating drug use here. I'm just explaining how, how, you know, how it is, but the people see that have happens. had those experiences, mm. I, I want to try it. I honestly really, really do to, to have that here's as an educational thing. Here's what would happen on my trip though. I would be on a shelf in a hardware store as an actual discount. Now, this is a, this is a, an, this is an inside <laughs> story. So you, you don't know the backstory to this. So it's going to sound really weird I to you. Andrew, but, um, I'm in, a, I'm in a hardware <laughs> store as a, uh, as a, um, a, a garden gnome and I'm with the other garden gnomes, but I'm the only one that has a discount sticker on, um, on the, the gnome itself. And so that would be, I would be, I would spend 15 minutes on a shelf, a hardware shelf. Um, I had, I had a, um, a viewer call me a discount, a discount garden gnome in a comment one time, and it's just stuck with me ever since then. I can't, um, that's, it's, that's the most hurtful that's thing. That's why you need to have psychedelics to get over it, actually. Um, he was yeah, talking yeah, about psychedelic. Probably do. And you were, I, I assume you were talking about <laughs> microdosing for, for psychedelics for people that, to get over anxiety and to, to, to have it incorporated in their, in their life for mental disorders because they are looking at microdosing, very small the dosing of LSD where you don't have a, a lot of hallucinogenic effects, although it does change your perception of reality somewhat because any – oops, my, my head just, headphones are going nuts. Um, there is always uh, some kind of change in perception. Let me fix this one. Yeah, that's right. In microdosing, the idea is to take a sub-perceptual dose. 
So the smallest mm-hmm. amount you can basically take, and if you start seeing like snakes and you know shapes change, then you've taken too much. Uh, or just any any kind of if you actually start to experience some of these uh i hate the word hallucinations but things like that perceptual changes then you've taken too much and yeah those those are being studied as, uh, for creativity inspiration too microdosing is a huge thing in in silicon valley apparently and because people realize that all, all kinds of inventions and art and scientific discoveries have been made through people like you said just getting this inspiration or knowledge while they've d- dived into these kinds of states. So it is fascinating. But as far as the the trauma aspect, I, I think high dose sessions are, are great for that as far as, because it's more like, like doing therapy than taking a drug. The, the healing power of these things isn't that they're altering your brain chemistry. It's that they're showing you things about yourself. You're doing deep internal work. It's actually really the opposite of of what a classical drug is, because instead of just taking a pill that makes something go away, you're doing a deep dive into yourself and learning how to be with yourself and actually process things. So it, it's really a lot like therapy in that regard. So how how would you how, what would you recommend to somebody like for myself um, that I, I since I am fascinated by this and and I and I you know people are just like oh Steve just wants to trip balls no I really do want it to experience these things for my own edification because I do like philosophy and especially when it comes to ontology what would you recommend because I know there's some churches out there that allow for for you know uh, DMT and uh, ayahuasca but a few other things but the, you have to go to a very specific place to go do these things I live in California all I can have access to is marijuana they, they psilocybin and, and other things are not legal here um, Colorado's looking to to legalize it but unless you're doing a study how how, how would a person go about uh, doing this properly safely and under under somebody's guidance and and hopefully legally yeah. eBay. <laughs> <laughs> don't do eBay. I don't recommend that. Definitely. Deep uh, web. Wanna... <laughs> yeah, not my recommendation. So the go down psychedelic no. <laughs> the psychedelic movement has existed primarily by the what's the underground. It's been an underground thing because it's illegal and uh, people tend to kind of frown at that but really i i think the the most accessible way for people is to there there are lots of underground therapists or shamans and people who make their living offering these amazing medicines and you know often risking their welfare because they could get prosecuted but i think they're doing an amazing service because most people don't have access to these clinical trials and you know this is it's time for us to decriminalize nature. These things are a part of nature there. And, and people are looking for healing. People are desperate to get better and also to, to harness our creativity and, and our natural gifts and to evolve and to raise our awareness. So, I mean, one way I recommend finding out is a lot of times cities have like psychedelic societies or clubs, or you can find events and lectures being put on is this movement has really caught a lot of steam Uh, mushrooms and MDMA are in stage three clinical trials with the FDA right now. And both of them have breakthrough therapy status. They're being expedited by the FDA for usage in therapy, uh, Mm -hmm. being overseen by a therapist because of just how much scientific evidence there is that these things are effective. But until that happens, you know, people have the option that again, I'm not recommending uh, of, of using these underground methods, which again, you go to these events, find people who are, have these interests and you're, you're certain to find some access to it with someone who's trustworthy, uh, who has experience administering them. I recommend everyone using a guide, especially starting out because if you pay attention to your mindset and to the setting and environment that you're in, and you have some counseling about how to deal with these experiences, it makes it very unlikely that you're going to have a bad experience. And if it starts going there, you'll have some tools and help to be able to redirect that. So 90% of bad experiences or difficult experiences happen because of bad environments and people not paying attention to the right protocol. 
Uh, also, you know, check if there's any contraindications, like do your research, 